Part 1. Adopting a Miserable Lifestyle What a miserable thing life is. You're living in clover, only the clover isn't good enough. Bertolt Brecht When I first see someone who is alarmed by a prolonged period of low mood, I generally complete a full assessment. I find out about the person's overall health, recent traumatic events and life history and upbringing. I ask about each of the diagnostic criteria for the depressive disorders. A first appointment with me is something of a cross between a chat over tea and a CIA interrogation. Toward the end of the session, I often shift gears. William, I'd like you to imagine for a moment that we go outside and grab the next 12 people who pass by this building. We're going to give them your life, your sleep schedule, your level of exercise, your diet, your amount of social contact. We'll give them your job, your boss, your home, your family, your financial situation. Everything. 24 hours a day, we'll have them live exactly the way you've been living recently. After a month, we'll come back and see how they're doing. How do you think they'd be? William, a bit disoriented to discover that he's consulting a madman, blinks a bit. Then, whether his name is William, or Joanna, or Kamal, or Carmeletta, the reply is almost always the same. I think they'd be depressed. Usually I agree. Notice what I don't do. I don't give our abductees William's childhood history or losses, or any of the other factors that might be involved in the development of his low mood. I just give them the life he leads now. Usually that's enough to make his present mood understandable. Sometimes I have to throw in, and we'll have them think the way you think. At that point, he is all but certain to agree that the mood makes perfect sense. More often, however, giving our captives his behaviour is enough. Does this mean that none of those other causes of low mood are relevant? Of course not. The near-drowning incident when he was 11, and the bullying he experienced all through high school are still with him. The divorce last year, his diabetes diagnosis, and the home invasion six months ago are profound influences. They will have to be dealt with. But they led him to adopt a way of living that now, alone, is sufficient to keep the fire burning. If all I do is focus on his history and ignore his current lifestyle, we will get nowhere. I will be fighting a forest fire by trying to track down the careless campers who started it. Useful, perhaps, but insufficient. If William is so displeased by his present mood, why does he not simply change his behaviour? The answer lies in the interconnections between mood and impulse. As the mood darkens, the natural tendency is to withdraw and self-protect, conserving energy as we retreat into the depths of the cave to recover. William is doing what feels natural to him, so much so that it seems impossible for him to do anything else. Causality, in this instance, travels in both directions. In order for our mood to become like William's, we do not need the divorce, the bullying, the home invasion or the diabetes. All we need is to adopt his lifestyle. Misery is not out of reach for even the most fortunate among us. Let's consider 10 of the most useful strategies. Lesson 1. Avoid all exercise. There is a firm tradition when writing a book of useful life tips. The author starts out with minor points and gradually builds towards more powerful ones. Partly this is a trick to keep the reader engaged out of pure suspense, but in this somewhat perverse volume, let's perversely do the opposite. Imagine that someone announced that she wanted to lower her mood, but that 40 changes seemed far too many. What if she were only willing to try 10? Which 10 would be the most effective? What if she were willing to make only 5 changes? 3? What if she were only willing to change one thing? In that case, the choice would be simple. To increase your level of misery, reduce your level of exercise. Of course, this recommendation is problematic because for many who live in developed societies, it is all but impossible to carry out. The average citizen's level of exertion is already about as low as it can possibly get without outright paralysis. Teenagers complain of cramps if forced to walk to the convenience store. 30-year-olds pause for breath halfway up a flight of stairs. 40-year-olds circle parking lots like descending airbuses, searching for a space 10 yards closer to the donut shop. The low level of physical fitness probably accounts for a great deal of the pre-existing misery in Western societies. It may not have been pleasant for cave people to be chased by saber-toothed tigers, but at least it gave them an occasional workout. Nevertheless, for those whose lifestyle involves sufficient activity to set off a motion detector now and then, reducing the amount of exercise is a sound strategy. There is a huge body of evidence linking inactivity to lower mood. 
helpful researchers have examined the issue from all angles. When people are tested for both physical fitness and mood, an inverse relationship between the two is typically found. Especially unhappy individuals, those diagnosed with clinical depression, are, on average, less physically fit than their more cheerful counterparts. Clever misery seekers will point out a snag with this research. The chicken and egg problem. Are sedentary people more miserable, or do the more miserable exercise less? The correct answer is, it appears, both. This makes the avoidance of exercise particularly potent. Do less exercise, and your mood will decline, resulting in a greater tendency to be inactive. If you can successfully initiate just a few vicious circles like this one, you will be well on your way to unhappiness. Still not convinced? Take active individuals and reduce their level of exercise. Within as little as two weeks, fatigue and negative mood will begin to set in. Take unhappy individuals and randomly assign them to exercise classes 30 minutes, three times a week, or no such classes. On average, the exercisers will experience a loss of misery, whereas their inactive associates can serve it. The mood-raising effect of exercise is approximately as powerful as medication or psychotherapy. Those wishing greater unhappiness in their lives, then, must avoid physical fitness at all costs. Luckily, all of Western society is there to help. In previous eras, you would inadvertently get exercised by doing almost anything. Running after buffalo, harvesting rice, gathering firewood, avoiding hostile neighbours. Today we have built a culture in which exercise is non-essential and even inconvenient. You seldom have to lift or carry anything of any weight. You need never walk more than a city block, and elevators, essentially forklifts for humans, can take you to any floor of any building you enter. Today, people who want to be more fit often find that they have to drive to a business specially devoted to that purpose, change their clothes, get on special exercise machines that accomplish nothing other than help the inert burn energy, change their clothes again, and drive home. Some gyms have escalators, so you needn't exhaust yourself climbing any stairs before you arrive at the Stairmaster. Of course, anyone who watches late-night television will know that gyms are not essential. One can simply purchase cheaply built home exercise equipment. This is easily avoided. But if you one day awaken and discover with alarm that you or a well-meaning friend has ordered such a device, all is not lost. Just do what almost everyone else does. Hang a piece of clothing on it. Henceforth, it is unlikely to be used for anything else. The only caution about exercise is that it must be avoided religiously. As noted in the above studies, just 30 minutes of exercise three times per week is sufficient to disrupt unhappiness in most people, and exercise beyond this level is even worse. So it is not sufficient just to let your gym membership lapse. You must be more diligent. Drive wherever you go, even when walking might ultimately be faster. Aim to spend at least twice as much time on your posterior as you do on your feet. Purchase a pedometer and aim to end the day having taken less than a thousand steps. Select leisure activities and professions for their sedentary qualities. Web surfing is good. Surfboarding is bad. Desk work serves your purpose. Real work defeats it. The unhappy heart is a fragile organ. It must never be permitted to pump rapidly. <laughs>